Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Each week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, with artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, and government leaders. We meet each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome historian Beverly Gage to the program. You've read her articles in a host of newspapers and magazines, and some of you may even have studied 20th century American history with her at Yale. But today, she's going to tell us about a bombing in the financial district, which could have been ripped from today's headlines. It occurred on September 16, 1920. Her book, The Day Wall Street Exploded, America in Its First Age of Terror, has just been published by the Oxford University Press, and it's received rave reviews. Welcome. Thanks, Cheryl. Beverly, why don't you describe the incident that's the subject of your book? Sure. Um, on September 16, 1920, a horse-drawn cart pulled up alongside the Morgan Bank on Wall Street. And at 12.01, as people were beginning to leave their offices for lunch, it exploded into the lunchtime crowd. Um, it blew out windows throughout the financial district. It was really a pretty massive explosion, shut down the financial markets for the day, and it killed 30 people, I mean, 38 people, and wounded several hundred. And that made it, in its moment, uh, the worst terrorist attack in American history. What made you want to write about it? Well, I initially came across it, and I think the thing that motivated me is what I hope will, will motivate a lot of people to pick up the book, which is just the fact that I had never heard of it. I was a graduate student at Columbia at the time, and I was reading through a textbook, and it had a one-sentence mention of this event. And uh, there were a lot of events in American history that I had never heard of, but this was so striking. Um, and it seemed to me like it might be a window into a world that seemed very different from the one that we were living in. This was the late 1990s. Right. It was the height of the dot-com <laughs> boom. It was a moment when it seemed like Wall Street could do no wrong, and there was this global consensus about American capitalism um, and its role in the world. And this just seemed like uh, a great story and also a window into a time when these questions were a little bit more open and a little bit more contested. And you were found that there was uh, a previous period when people were very, very unhappy with Wall Street. That's right. That's right. So part of the book is about this bombing, in particular about the detective story, the hunt for the perpetrators, which uh, didn't work out so well in the end. But a lot of what the book's trying to do is recapture this moment in the late 19th and early 20th century when you had this massive national debate over Wall Street, over the rise of industrial capitalism, when you had people marching in the streets in favor of J.P. Morgan, against J.P. Right. Morgan, <clears throat> um, and in which all of these questions were very open. The background for the Wall Street bombing had been laid down many years before it took place uh, by the anarchists, the radical union members, many of whom were immigrants. What was sort of that, what was swirling around at that time? What was it like? Right. Well, the bomb goes off in 1920, and immediately people look at it, and they're, of course, shocked and surprised at the level of devastation. Uh, but the thing that was really striking to me was this idea that they should have seen it coming. This is what a lot of people said. And so it opened up a whole discussion about all sorts of issues that have been underway. I mean, the issue of terrorism, uh, and I trace out several other terrorist events in the book, leading back to the Haymarket bombing of 1886, the assassination of William McKinley in 1901 um, and others that we can talk about here today. But uh, it also opened up a, a whole conversation about a host of other issues, including immigration. Um, this was a period of massive immigration into the United States. And by 1920, immigration restriction was one of the things that was really being called into question. Um, it's in the early 1920s that the United States establishes its first really far-reaching permanent immigration restrictions. And many of them are targeted at uh, groups that are thought to be not only somehow racially different, but also uh, groups that were thought to carry uh, radicalism, a propensity toward terrorism, uh, mainly uh, Russians, Italians, who were heavily associated with ideologies like anarchism or communism. So it played a pretty big role there. We know the names, you know, of some of the terrorists and educators. Some of them are very, very well known. Alexander Berkman, who tried to murder Henry Clay Frick down at the Carnegie um, plant in Pennsylvania, Emma Goldman, uh, Sacco and Benzetti, um, who have become sort of really martyrs <laughs> to their cause. Do we tend to over-romanticize these people? 
Well, I think there is a tendency of sorts to over-romanticize. I mean, Sacco and Vanzetti in particular, though there have been several historians who have pointed out the ways in which kind of the public image of Sacco and Vanzetti as martyrs doesn't always entirely fit uh, the reality of what happened. But one of the things that I really tried to do in the book was to look at figures like Emma Goldman, Alexander Berkman, Sacco and Vanzetti, uh, Big Bill Haywood, the leader of the IWW during this period, and to really talk pretty frankly about what their ideas about violence and terrorism in particular were. Sacco and Vanzetti are probably the most dramatic example uh, because they really were members of a group of Italian anarchists in the United States, mainly in Massachusetts, but uh, in New York and other areas as well, who were actually quite openly committed to the use of certain kinds of terrorism, assassinations right. and bombings as part of their kind of political program, part and, of their political campaign. And while Sacco and Vanzetti may not have robbed the paymaster, you know, in Massachusetts for which, in Braintree, for which they were um, executed, they were involved in some nasty stuff, at least supporting it, right? Right. So this circle of... Um of anarchists that they were members of were followers of a man named Luigi Galeani, who had been, uh, since coming to the United States in the early 20th century and even earlier, had been a very open advocate of terrorism. And this group of anarchists around him firmly believed that terrorism was a way to strike a blow against an unjust capitalist system, against a tyrannical state. And they had engaged in various bombing campaigns uh, prior to the Wall Street bombing and certainly prior to uh, the big Sacco and Vanzetti case of the early 1920s. The case for which they were actually tried and, and martyred, some people would say, uh, was actually fairly a political crime. It was the murder uh, and robbery of a couple of uh, payroll guards in Massachusetts. So it wasn't uh, that aspect of their lives didn't come out as fully um, in the trial or in the memory, perhaps as a result of that fact. Some of the other political and union activists, Big Bill Haywood, whom you mentioned, who was, uh, he was a union organizer, Eugene Debs, who was a socialist leader, and Tom Mooney, who was another uh, union organizer, all of whom served time in jail. Were, were these three, do we know that they were engaged in or responsible for any actual violence? I know they were accused of a connection right. or fomenting it, but do we know? Right. Well, I think they're all three pretty different cases. So Bill Haywood was put on trial in uh, 1906 and 1907 for the murder of the governor of Idaho, a man named Frank Stunenberg at that time, who had been a very prominent foe of labor organizing, particularly in the Western mines. And at that point, Haywood was an official of a group called the Western Federation of Miners. So he's put on trial. Clarence Darrow comes in to represent him. It's one of these big, big cases of the early 20th century in which people say this is a battle between capital and labor and what happens to Bill Haywood uh, will determine what the fate of both of these sides will be. And Haywood in that case was acquitted. Now, there's some question about whether he should have been acquitted or not. And many historians suggest uh, that he was actually, at least in some manner or another, involved in the conspiracy to uh, to kill Stunenberg. And certainly the Western Federation of Miners engaged in a variety of, of other bombing campaigns, uh, mostly aimed at non-union employers. So in Haywood's case, I mean, he was very heavily identified in the public mind with violence. Um, he certainly played with that a lot, uh, suggesting, you know, by God, we've got to have reform or, you know, more violence will come. At other times, he completely renounced it. So he really went back and forth. Uh, Eugene Debs, on the other hand, the leader of the Socialist Party in the United States during this period, was almost uniformly certainly opposed to terrorism. I mean, when he talked about the day that socialist revolution might actually come in the United States around the world, he acknowledged that it might well be a bloody revolution. But he was really quite different from Haywood and, uh, and tended to oppose terrorism, though he acknowledged that it was, it was an open question about whether this was a good tactic or not. Um, people are pretty angry with Wall Street right now, uh, real angry. Uh, but there hasn't been any violence. Why are we just in a different period? Why? Right. Well, uh, maybe that it's too early to, uh, to to make these assessments, but it's certainly true that the phrase the day Wall Street exploded has taken on a, a different meaning in the present day. And I think it's a tough question. You know, it's certainly the politics of this moment are very different from what we saw uh, 100 years ago. I mean, you have a whole different legislative system. You have uh, much better worker protections. But I think probably the most important factor in kind of shaping the dissent is that in the early 20s, 
20th century, there were millions of people who believed that a revolution was on the way, right, rightly or wrongly. And they believed that they were working toward that revolution in one way or another. It was going to be a socialist revolution. It was going to transform capitalism. And a lot of these acts of violence fit in there. Whereas today, I think it's hard to argue that many people have, you know, inspiring alternatives to the present system. Right. And so everybody's sort of, uh, it's a much I guess, narrower range of debate. The government at the time of, of the, the 1920 bombing and before, the government was really faced with a huge dilemma, uh, protecting citizens' rights to free speech and political dissent as guaranteed by the Constitution, and yet protecting the country from those who wanted to overthrow the government. Um, because these were some scary, dangerous people. Uh, and it doesn't seem like the country did a very good job of solving that dilemma. Well, this does come, the, the Wall Street bombing, at the height of what's known as the post-war Red Scare, a moment when all of these questions about civil liberties for political radicals, much less people who advocated terrorism, but anarchists, communists in particular, have been the source of tremendous controversy, uh, actually from World War I itself. World War I in the United States was a notorious period um, in which the Wilson administration really went after critics of the war. This is the moment that Eugene Debs, for instance, is jailed. Uh, not for advocating any sort of violence, much less committing it, but actually just for speaking out against the war. So it's really a critical moment for American civil liberties. Uh, this is a moment when the ACLU is founded. Um, and as the post-war period came and their concerns about the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, which had just occurred, and these bombings at home, a lot of people argued you had to have widespread suppression of dissent, um, even in peacetime. So you have events like the Palmer deportation raid, it's probably the most famous episode in which uh, tens of thousands of anarchists, communists, many of them immigrants, most of them immigrants, uh, were rounded up and many of them subjected to deportation for their beliefs. We've got to take a short break. We'll be back with more with historian Beverly Gage, author of The Day Wall Street Exploded, America in Its First Age of Terror, after the following message. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. I'm talking with Beverly Gage, author of The Day Wall Street Exploded, America in Its First Age of Terror. Your book is about the violence that was being done to, you know, on Wall Street and directed against uh, uh, political uh, figures. Um, but there was also terrible violence that was being of another type that was being committed by against the anarchists and the workers. Um, I mean, I mean the the working conditions were terrible. You know, people doing backbreaking labor that destroyed their health, sometimes their lives. You know, working 14 hours a day, seven days a week for crummy wages. Um, and when they tried to organize, they were often fired or jailed or physically hurt or killed. Was terrorism the only route left to them to make the country take notice of what was happening to them? Well, this is certainly what advocates of terrorism suggested. And this is a period in which working conditions were often, I think, would be almost unthinkable to people living today and used to the kind of protections that we have in this country as well. Uh, the death rate from industrial accidents in the late 19th century was about 100 people a day, or about 35,000 people a year. And you had very little ability to organize labor unions, despite a growing labor movement. I mean, whether or not you were going to be able to organize was often fought out, not in courts and not through uh, labor boards, but at the point of a gun. So it's also a period of vicious labor battles, much of that uh, violence by employers toward their employees, uh, state militias, even 
even sometimes federal troops brought in to suppress labor disturbances. So people who argued, and there were never a whole lot of them, right? I mean, terrorism by its nature is almost always something adopted and advocated by a very tiny proportion of any movement. But the people who did say, you know, bombings and assassinations in this moment are justified made exactly that case. They said, look, there are so few other recourses. We need to illustrate the grievances of a besieged working class, and this is the way to do it. It's a way to strike terror into the people uh, who actually have the power and to uh, have these symbolic acts that would rally rally the troops. In right. Essence. After the Wall Street bombing uh, bomb went off, forensic sci at the time, forensic science was not what it is now. Um, so how did the people investigating the bombing, how did they find information? Well, the investigation into the Wall Street bombing was not exactly a model of, uh, of law enforcement success, shall we say. And this was evident almost from the very first day when the bomb went off. So this massive explosion happens, and you have a whole series of agencies rushing down to Wall Street, most notably uh, the New York Police Department and its bomb squad, which was relatively new at that point, the federal authorities, and these are the, the early glimmers of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. J. Edgar Hoover is back there as a very young man. Um, and then you had a whole series of private detectives who said, you know, we're going to do better than the established authorities and we're going to solve the case. Um, they all have pretty limited tools at hand. You don't have a lot of modern forensics at this point. So as the investigation developed, they mostly relied on undercover informants, um, on their own networks of informants within uh, radical communities that they had tried to develop. But these often fell apart. You see them complaining, you know, we don't have uh, any men who really speak Italian who we can send into uh, undercover uh, communities of uh, Italian anarchists in that case. Um, and you also have the inherent unreliability of a lot of the undercover informants that they were uh, they were looking to. Right. So the investigation as a whole um, didn't succeed very well, though they got pretty close, it seems. And there were all kinds of theories about what happened. First was that it was an accident, just right. a, a regular explosive wagon onto some on its way to some site that, that blew up. Then they settled on the anarchist. And then later, then it became, it was the socialist. Uh, and then I think they came back to the anarchist. Um, the, and, the, and, and as you said, this was a crime that was never solved. Why do you think it was, why do you think it was never solved? I mean, that's sort of amazing to me. I don't know why, that it was never solved. But then I guess Sackleman said, you know, that, that robbery has never been solved either. Why do you think, why do you think? It well, they certainly hard. tried very hard to solve the crime, and you're right. A lot of people said uh, it was an accident. I mean, radicals, uh, anarchists, communists, socialists, uh, many people who were sympathetic with these movements uh, maintained that theory to the end, that this had just been an accident, uh, a dynamite shipment to a construction site that had been uh, trumped up into a terrorist plot. The two main theories, that it was this group of Italian anarchists around Sacco and Benzetti, or that it had somehow been uh, ordered by Lenin and Trotsky, uh, from from Moscow, those ended up being the theories that the investigators pursued. Um, I think in part uh, we had a difficult moment uh, between these various agencies, which were not sharing information. In fact, were rivals and were trying to outdo each other. I think that really damaged the investigation. I think part of it was all of the chaos and turmoil that had been going on within these movements who had been subjected to deportation already. People are scattered to the winds, um, really hard to, to track people down, even if you thought you had your hands on the guilty party. Mm -hmm. And the Federal Bureau certainly ran into that. But I think, in essence, uh, it was really just a matter of um, a basic lack of kind of competence and cooperation on the part of law enforcement, combined with a real hesitancy by this moment to charge the wrong people and take them to trial in the fear that if that happened, you were going to create martyrs and that that would serve as a mm -hmm. rallying point. So, Do you have your own theory about whether it was a crime or an accident and about who might have done it? Well, I think the Federal Bureau actually got fairly close as they were looking at the Galliani anarchists. Um, there's a historian named Paul Average who uh, unfortunately died a few years ago, but who has been a historian of anarchism, probably the most prominent historian of anarchism, was a professor at Queens College uh, for many years, who first floated the theory in the early 90s that it had actually been a man named Mario Buda, who was a very close friend of Sacco and Banzetti's, 
And Average's theory is that he was doing it in retaliation for their arrest, also as a much more general blow against capitalism and government. Um, and I think that remains the best theory. Buddha's name doesn't come up a lot in mm -hmm. the federal files that I looked at. In fact, it doesn't come up at all. But even though this crime is now almost 90 years old, um, those files still have page after page uh, that have been blacked out by right. the FBI. So maybe his, his name's in there. I think by far and away, it's the, it's the best scenario that we have have, but it's just not definitive at this point. And, and I, as I recall, I think, you know, just before Sacco and Benzetti were arrested for the the robbery, I think the night before they were supposedly running around hiding stuff or collecting stuff from Buddha, you know, you know, that he had, had allegedly used in some attacks. Do you think this particular subject is especially relevant now uh, that the country is experiencing its economic meltdown? Well, unfortunately, uh, I think I think that it is. And as I said, you know, when I tell people uh, that I've written a book called The Day Wall Street Exploded, they actually they think, think I'm talking, talking about now. last September, <laughs> not September of uh, of 1920. Right. right. Um, so I think, you know, I think there are many ways in which just having a basic reminder about how actually contested all of these issues have been. The fact that there was a moment when many people said, oh, American capitalism, it's not going to survive. Wall Street's going down. Um, that there have been many, many contests about this over, over time, um, I think is a useful reminder. I don't know if it's a comforting reminder or not, but I actually think in the end what remains most striking to me is just how different our moment is from this earlier moment for some of the reasons that we were talking about before. I mean, despite the fact that Wall Street is certainly being assailed at this moment by all sorts of parties, there just aren't any people saying, ah, tear the whole thing down, <laughs> right? Um, in a way that there really were a, a hundred years ago, again, for, for better or worse worse. But, um, but that range of debate that we saw 100 years ago, I think, uh, it just isn't, isn't the same sort of debate that we're seeing today. And one of the reasons is that, you know, after the bombing period, and there was continued to be unrest in, by, and terror after 1920, but you had a change in a lot of the policy. I mean, you had a lot of reforms you know, labor reforms. And, you know, I eventually we went, to, eventually we went to the eight hour day and, uh, you know, uh, higher wages. We also, you know, to, to an extent, the deportations of the, uh, some of the, immig the immigrants uh, and crackdowns, you know, putting immigration quotas in, you know, so sort of cut down on this element that was here or, the, or their ability to come here. And so some of that, you know, you know, you didn't have as much reason to, to try to bomb the capitalists and you didn't have the people to do it, correct? Right, yeah. I mean, one of the striking things about this bombing is it goes off and everybody says, I mean, as, as is often said after terrorist attacks in the present day, oh no, this is a major escalation and this is going to lead to further escalation in the future. But the pretty dramatic thing about the Wall Street bombing is that it turns out to really be the last big event of its kind mm -hmm. in that age uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, Wall Street itself just says, we're not going to pay any attention to this. They reopen the financial markets the next day. They are very uh, serious about making sure that the market goes up the next day and uh, far from being Did it a go major, up the next day? It did go up the yeah. next day. Uh, far from being a major blow to Wall Street, of course, you know, seen from the long picture of at least the 1920s itself, uh, it turns out to be a boom decade for Wall Street. From your students at Yale, um, what kind of emotions do I mean, do you hear anger, fear, disgust, what do you hear being expressed about our financial system, about the, uh, the CEOs of the major companies, about Wall Street? What are you hearing? Well, I think the first thing that we're hearing is fear. I mean, this concern that they've worked hard for four years uh, and that the future is very uncertain, not just from students who wanted to go into the financial services industry, of which there were uh, are still, but were more, uh, quite a few at a place like Yale, but also from other students who wanted to take on entirely different careers and feel like, uh, in some very literal way, their future was, was mortgaged. Um, so I think there's definitely a deep sense that there needs to be not just surface change, uh, but that there needs to be some kind of fundamental rethinking of what's going on. And for people who are in college right now, they're just hoping that it happens fast enough. Uh, for graduate students as well, it's a pretty bleak moment. Students who have spent five, seven years working on their PhDs are going out um, and finding that already uh, job cutbacks are severe. This is one of the worst years to be applying for a job coming out of graduate school um, in, in decades. 
decades, mm -hmm. and it was never that good before. Right, it was. It has never been great. Um, what, if anything, did the Wall Street bombing accomplish? It's a great question. I mean, one of the big debates, tactical debates, uh, among, again, the very small number of people who took up the question of terrorism as a tactic was, does it accomplish anything? And I think in the case of the Wall Street bombing, you have to argue that it really didn't accomplish anything. If anything, um, it accomplished in many ways the opposite of whatever uh, we can presume the person, if it was Mario Buda, was seeking to accomplish in the sense that it rallied public sentiment around Wall Street. Um, it made Wall Street see very sympathetic, like a victim. Um, and this was the primary ideological response throughout almost all of the country. Um, on the other hand, I think when you look at the big picture of terrorism and violence during this period, uh, particularly events like the bombing of the Los Angeles Times in 1910, uh, I think there's a good argument that it actually did serve to kind of illustrate in a very dramatic way some of the grievances over questions of capital and labor um, that weren't getting much of a hearing uh, in other formats. So did it work? I think you would have to say no mm -hmm. in any concrete or immediate sense, but it certainly became uh, a force for massive national debate. Fascinating, and I really enjoyed the book. Thanks a lot. We're out of time, but I want to thank Beverly Gage for joining us. The Day Wall Street Exploded, America in Its First Age of Terror, has just been published by the Oxford University Press for the City University of New York and One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy.